start the recording. We are recording. Welcome, everybody. It's 12 o'clock. My name's Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester, and I'm the host of the Forest Connect. I run the Forest Connect program, and part of that is the Forest Connect monthly webinar series where I have the honor and privilege of bringing in fabulous speakers, such as today's speaker. Jeff Ward, who's going to be talking about rehabilitation of degraded hardwood stands. And I've known Jeff for many, many years. I was his, I was an undergraduate at Purdue and Jeff was getting his PhD there and I was his, his field grunt. And we have uh, fabulous memories of going out and working in hordes of mosquitoes and mud and uh, sleeping next to pig pens and things like that. So it's a, uh, but but Jeff's memory Jeff's memory is better than mine, so I'm not going to tell any stories about Jeff because he could he could no doubt scoop me. So, with that with that as an introduction, and Jeff has done some fabulous work over the years. I just I really enjoy um, every time Jeff does some new project that because uh, it's always top notch and uh, and very useful, powerful information. So with that, Jeff, I'm going to mute my microphone. I'm just going to hover here in the background and. The floor is yours. Welcome and thank you. No, post hole digger actually, PhD actually means uh, pilot higher and deeper for those of you who know what BS is. That's what a PhD is. So I want to thank everyone uh, who's attending today. And I'm um, going to talk a little bit about some of our work on rehabilitating degraded hardwood stands and just notes from what we've observed and from what we've read on the web. So if I can get my computer to work, there we go. So what we're going to cover today, we're going to first of all talk about the uh, definition of what is a degraded stand or a poorly stocked stand, the extent of uh, how much they are across uh, the northeast landscape, and then we'll talk about what you can do, a whole stand versus a micro stand approach, and I'll very definitely give you my opinion on that. Uh, and when you do that, what do you do with residual stems uh, that are in a, uh, a degraded stand, uh, everything from the sapling to the pole timber to the saw timber? And uh, also talk about the regeneration that's uh, present on the stand. So I, I actually looked around and I finally found what I think is maybe the best uh, definition I've been able to find of what a degraded stand in. And that's by Thompson et al. And uh, mostly uh, Canadians are the first authors, but it's actually an international group. And they said that forest degradation is broadly defined as reduction in the capacity of a forest to produce ecosystem services, such as carbon storage. And I think maybe more of what we're looking at here is wood products as a result of anthropogenic, that just means human, environmental changes. And I think ecosystem services for a lot of people nowadays also includes just having a diverse uh, bird population out there because a lot of us like birds and wildlife. And part of it is when you look at it is, you know, any forest, any ecosystem fluctuates over time. It goes up and down. Sometimes there's more of something, sometimes less. We have degradation when a stand gets into what you can see on the graph there and see if I can bring my mouse up. There we go. And the lower part here is once a stand starts uh, becoming degraded, they show that it really, it's having a hard time recovering back up to which that normal fluctuations, that normal range of variability that you'll see in a stand. I mean, we've all seen, you know, stands, you'll have some cutting on there, but the trees will grow back again. But if you happen to have a lot of deer, for example, on a stand, you might not be able to get the forest regeneration. So the amount of biomass in a forest declines and it really has a hard time recovering unless or until, you know, a factor like the deer are removed. <clears throat> and they give all these technical definitions and this is more for a, uh, a United Nations report on how they're gonna measure it around the world and define it. I'm just really gonna focus on one thing today that it's one thing that we can measure and manipulate pretty easily, and that's growing stock. But I want you to notice that there's other things they mentioned, like ecosystem state, invasive species, uh, fire, and how it's susceptible to fire. I think certainly a thing that's important, especially here in the Northeast, is soil erosion, where a lot of us depend on um, uh, water and reservoirs. And if you have a lot of soil erosion, you start having problems. Stored carbon is a big thing now uh, nowadays. So there's a, a lot of factors you can measure, but I'm going to focus more on growing stock. And for those of you, the foresters out there, you know, with degraded stand, you know, we tend to think of it more as what's a poorly stocked stand. 
So if you look in a stocking chart, you could consider it under 60%. And I'm going to, for those who aren't foresters, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later, what, what stocking is. But for foresters, if you're under 60% stocking, it's considered understocked. If you're under 40%, that's considered non-stocked. I think Wayne Clatterbuck at Tennessee uh, came up with a good just catch-all thing where you're looking at one that stands as poorly stocked. And that's 50% uh, of basal area per acre. And again, later on, I'll explain what basal area is for those of you unfamiliar with the term, is acceptable growing stock. And that's what ag is, is the threshold. Another way you can do it is, is you know it when you see it. Because um, part of it depends upon what you're managing for. If you're managing for birds and wildlife, you know, a lot of trees which have cavities in them and might not be timber producers might be just the sort of tree that you want to have out there. So a big part of it depends upon what your goal, what your objective is for the land you have. <clears throat> it's kind of shocking when you look at how big of a problem are poorly stocked stands across the landscape. Well, uh, forest inventory and analysis, which is the unit of the Forest Service, tracks across the country uh, all sorts of forest statistics. And one of the things they've reported is that here in Little Connecticut, we have 200,000 acres of poorly stocked stands. So that stands with less than 60% stocking. And in Southern New England, 600,000 acres. But what's really amazing is across New England, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, 16% of the forest, 3 million acres are now poorly stocked. And uh, oh, why am I blanking out on Tom's last name right now? He's with the Forest Service. In one of his papers, he took a look at it and found there's another 7.5 million acres are one harvest away from becoming poorly stocked. So if we add all that together, that's 10 million acres, which are either poorly stocked now or at risk of becoming poorly stocked. That's nearly, uh, if you add 16 and 32% together, 48%, so that's almost half the forest in the Northeast is either poorly stocked or at risk of becoming poorly stocked. It's pretty scary. There's a lot of reasons why we can have degraded stands and those with poor stock. Sometimes we can have a high water table, and chances are you're never going to grow much there. It depends upon where you're at. Uh, here in southern New England and in a lot of the country, it's going to become a red maple swamp. You could have heavy duff layers that inhibit regeneration after a forest harvest. Or on top of a lot of ridges, you could have uh, skeletal soils. You can also have a problem because of past land use and what came in. You can have a poorly stocked stand like this one in Litchfield County, Connecticut, which had basically 100% uh, of unacceptable growing stock red maple. It was all junky red maple and dying ash trees with a complete understory, beautiful understory of uh, Japanese barberry, multiflora rose, and oriental bittersweet. Another reason to have a degraded stand, a poorly stocked stand, is when we have insect outbreaks like gypsy moths, which have recently devastated uh, Eastern Connecticut and Rhode Island and parts of Massachusetts. Some of the stands have over 90% oak mortality in them. Every tree you see in this picture, which was from over a year ago, we went back to that stand again this summer, every oak you see in that picture is now dead. What are you gonna do? And another problem across a lot of the country now is emerald ash borer. And this is another stand where the entire over story of ash is dead and there's nothing but red maple coming in underneath it. How are you going to manage that stand going forward? And those are questions I think we all have. A problem not so much here in the east usually is fire, but it certainly can be a component uh, in some stands. We also have a problem I think most of us have, which are deer and alien species. It's kind of scary when you look at an area with high deer density. This is a shelter wood that was put in 15 years ago. And you can see the almost complete lack of regeneration in the other store. I mean, there's no saplings at all. There's basically no seedlings at all. It can be very scary. But the most common cause of degraded stands, of poorly stocked stands across the region, probably across the world, is because people go in there, we'll talk a lot more on this, they go in there and they cut out everything that's worth any money and they just leave junk behind. And I think we've all seen that. 
And the reason why this happens is if you actually go out there and do an inventory, and we've done this on six stands in uh, Gary Miller, who just retired from the Forest Service, did this over in Pennsylvania and, and West Virginia. And you look at the value of, of the trees out there, only about 20 trees per acre account for 50% of that stand's value. So there's a real incentive to go out there and just cut 20 trees per acre, you get half the money. If you cut about 50 trees per acre out there, and remember, we're, we're talking poles and saw timber, so trees five inches in diameter and greater. And in hardwood stands, you're looking at 120 to 200 trees per acre. But if you only cut 50 trees per acre out of there, you capture 90% of that stand's economic value. And because a lot of these species like cherry and oak also have high ecosystem services value, especially for wildlife, you're actually capturing 90% of that stand's ecosystem services values. Now there's been a, a lot of early warning signs about the dangers of diameter limit cutting and selection harvest. And diameter limit cutting is when you just go out there and you just cut down those valuable trees and you don't worry about anything else, at least that's high grading. There was a, a, some work out of West Virginia by uh, Hudnick and Trumbull, you know, back around 1960. Uh, Bloom and Phillip, uh, 1963 in New Hampshire, Hart and Maine. They all found that decreased stand growth in poor quality residuals when you went in there and just did a strict diameter limit cutting. I have to say, I also did my uh, master's thesis in that on, uh, in Ohio back in 83. Ezo in Mississippi found the same thing down there. And Strong in Wisconsin also reported a higher proportion of residual calls and lower grade when you went in and did a diameter limit cutting. So how did we even start with diameter limit cutting? Whoops, I was supposed to make a pulse first. There we go. Well, before we do that, I, th I think the wake up call across the country really came when Ralph Nyland, uh, who just retired from uh, SUNY ESF, uh, had a, an article in a journal of forestry back in 1992. And he talked about the exploitation and greed in the Eastern hardwood forest. And he talked about, if you look in there, what's highlighted, it said there's been a resurgence in exploitation where people have just been going out there and doing timber mining. So how does this happen? Well, in northern hardwoods, selection harvest can be very appropriate for stands with shade intolerant, in shade tolerant valuable hardwoods. However, selection hardwoods harvest all too often slide over to the dark side of high grade. It is a great movie too with only larger economically valuable trees removed and no tending to the smaller size classes to maintain that, that diameter distribution you're supposed to have when you're doing selection harvest. So what happens if you do it right when you're doing a selection harvest? If we look in the upper left, we can see there's my drawing of what a forest is after a selection harvest. You're trying to cut some of the largest trees, but you're also tending in the smaller the diameter classes to provide growing space for new trees to come in and to maintain that diameter distribution you want. But all too often somebody goes, well, I need a new pickup truck. So maybe I'll go in there and I'll cut everything that's over, we'll say 14 inches. That's actually not necessarily bad if you were to go in there and also cut the calls out at the same time. But what then happens too is all too often they'll go in there, I need some real money, so I'm gonna go in there and cut down all the trees that have ec any economic value. And what happens is that you end up having a high grading. It's very easy to slip down this, that slippery slope from doing true single tree selection to diameter limit harvest to high grading. Well, most of my work actually has been in stratified second growth forest, oak forest, and I'll talk about why they're stratified in a section. And actually in those forests, in my opinion, the only harvest you should be doing out there are tending cuts where you go out there and do thinning. And then you do regeneration cuts. And how do these forests develop? Well, there's a, a lot of work. Most of it's been out of Yale talking about how these stratified forests develop. And I'll show a diagram here in a second, the same thing. But it's the idea that some species are much faster growing in height than others over time. So if we have a gradual divergence, like if we have a northern red oak, uh, red maple forest, you know, typical oak maple forest, the oaks after about stand age, when the stands are about 15 years old, when they, the canopy closes, you'll see the oaks growing gradually taller and taller and taller than the, uh, the maple, the birch and the beech. So you end up with a forest with oak on top, 
and birch or maple or beech growing underneath of it. You can also have another thing where it can happen quite quickly if you have something like hemlock, which is a much slower growing one. So just to show that in the diagram, what can happen over time, if we look at the yellow, those are the mid-tolerant species, which will eventually be in the canopy, things like oak and cherry, which grow faster, and a shade-tolerant sub-canopy, things like red maple and beech. So if we imagine that these trees are about, you know, a 15-year-old stand and we grow it over time, we see that the mid-tolerance gradually grow over top and come to dominate that stand with an understory of primarily maple, beech, birch, depends upon what you have. You could have hemlock or some other species down there. Well, one of the other things is those mid-tolerant species tend to have much higher economic value and much higher ecosystem services values than those shade-tolerant subcanopy species. So what can happen is if we start again, if we start with our forest, you should go there and, and do a thinning where you're releasing the competitors, those other upper canopy trees, the ones that you want to grow into larger diameter classes. But what will happen is commonly people will come in and they'll start doing a diameter limit harvest. You know, I need a little more money out of this sale. Sometimes that can be inevitable. And again, that could very definitely lead to high grading, lead to a degraded forest with poor stocking. So what happens after you have a high grading out there? You've got a degraded stand with lower quality species, slower growing species, which are now open to sunlight. And some species like uh, beech are much more prone to nectaria canker when they're opened up like that. Species like beech can get sun scald. And I saw a comment over there from uh, Gary Fish talking about up in uh, Maine, they end up with pure beach stands. It's not only in Maine, in a lot of the, uh, the Northeast, we have a real problem with beach uh, just coming in. It'll gradually get beach bark disease, you'll get beach snap, and you'll end up with those beach thickets of just junky beach, which never gets big because it always gets beach bark disease and breaks off. So just to give you an example how this worked on one of our uh, studies, if you're curious, you can find this in the Northern Journal of Forest Research or email me, I'll send you a paper. Is we did a study and we actually have this replicated on a number of sites. We looked at a diameter limit, a shelter wood, multi-age crop tree management, and I'll define all these in a second. Silviculture clear cut, which I'm not gonna talk about today, and a high grade. And we looked at how the stands grew after you put in those different cutting methods. So our commercial clear cut, that was the high grade. All trees greater than 11 inches were harvested if it was uh, all merchantable trees. So if it was a call tree or junky tree, it was left behind. With the diameter limit, actually that was George Stevens who put this in was trying to look at, they would remove the call trees. And then depending upon the site, uh, they would, for oak, sugar, maple, and ash, we had a 21 to 16 inch diameter limit. And for the other species, uh, there's a 16 to 14 inch diameter limit uh, cut on there. Multi-age crop tree management, if you wanna read through there, the idea what we were trying to do there was create five different age classes by coming in every 20 years, cutting out a fifth of the, the largest trees and starting to attend a new group of trees that grew in the poles. So we go through We'd remove a fifth of the trees. We'd find among the new poles or very large saplings. We'd pick an equal number of new crop trees and then we cut all of their poles out there. It was actually originally developed as a coppice with standards method over in Europe. But we're trying to adopt it for over here. And the shelterwood is very similar to a very, very intense, well, it was a shelterwood, but for here we're gonna think of it as an intense thinning. So there's just pictures where you can see each one of them from the high grading where all the trees of economic value were removed, diameter limit harvest where the calls were removed, and the trees over, like I say, oaks basically over 16 inches, along with sugar maple and ash, everything else over 14 inches, shelter wood, multi-age crop tree thinning, where you can think of this as like a city park where you've got, <coughs> excuse me, five different size classes of trees. And what's interesting when you look at this, look over in the far right, the high grade, where they took out all the economically valuable trees. 
And this is board foot volume growth six, over 16 years. Annual uh, board foot volume or net board, annual board foot volume growth, excuse me. There was almost no growth on the stand that was high graded. In fact, when we went back there and had the, the second harvest uh, back in uh, 2000, volumes were so low on those sites, we could not have a second commercial harvest. So we didn't even cut on those. But if you look at the other ones, we're actually growing close to 200 board feet per acre per year. So it's pretty comparable. Although when you do put in a diameter limit harvest, uh, you do cut the uh, amount of oak growing out there from about 200 board feet per acre per year down to 150. But here's the scary thing. We put in the second cutting cycle, we got done with it. And we found out that the diameter limit harvest to make that economically feasible harvest, because these, on all of our sites, these were all commercial sales. We had to drop the uh, diameter limit down to 16 inches for oak, maple, and ash, and 14 inches for everybody else. And because these, like many of the stands we have throughout the Eastern Hardwood Forest are fairly even age stands, we ended up skimming off most of the oak. So by the, t after the, the second cutting cycle, after the second harvest, the diameter limit plots looked almost identical as far as structure and as, as far as a basal area to the stands that had been high graded 20 years previously and only two cutting cycles. Here in 2020, we're gonna be putting in the third cutting cycle on all these. And I imagine we're gonna pretty much cut out all of the yolk and just a few cutting cycles. And I think that's all too common when we go out there and we don't think as foresters should, we don't think about what's gonna be the next generation of trees out there. And just to show you on some of these, what happens what, what compounds the problem is in many of our areas now, we've got a lot of deer and we've got invasive species. So on the top left, you can see that 15 year old shelterwood that I showed you before with no regeneration in it. What are you gonna do in that stand in the future? For right now, that stand, is, which is over a lake of lard, is just sitting there because if they harvest it, it would turn into the stand that you can see in the top right, which is where they put in a, a clear cut 15 years ago. And you've got a few birch poking up and you have some hot, hot porn being poking up, Australia. But everything else is coming in there, a small to four rows and barberry, and a lot of the trees are being pulled down by oriental bittersweet because we've got this problem of deer and invasive species. And it's scary too, it's, it's sort of, if you look in the lower uh, right, it's in bright green, just so you can see that that's 17 year old diameter limit cut. There are some pretty darn good size holes put in that canopy. Do you see any saplings out there? Do you see any uh, regeneration coming in there? You don't see any saplings, you really don't see any uh, poles or large seedlings. It's just re regeneration failure. There's not even really an opportunity to do much out there because of the deer in this case. So we've seen how degraded stands are a huge problem. I mean, it's 16% of the Northeast right now, the stands. Uh, there's potential with another harvest that up to half the stands in the Northeast. And we've seen the causes. So the question is, what can you do? Well, there's a, a couple of different approaches you can do. A whole stand versus micro stand. That's what we're gonna talk about first. I just wanted to share, this is the, some of you might have seen this, a true uh, stand from hell. It was a seven, no, 16 acre uh, island with 17 deer per square mile. Uh, I think there were a couple of sassafras, a couple of red maples and a black cherry on this. There's a couple acres of Norway maple and the rest of the forest was all Alanthus. So the question is, what do you do? It's a scary thing to think about. So, cause there's probably a couple non-forcers out there and I didn't want to, some of the rest is gonna be a little technical. So I just want to give an explanation of some of the technical words. So first of all, what's basal area? Well, we, we measure uh, tree diameters uh, by tradition at four and a half feet. So that's breast height. That's why we call it diameter breast height or DBH. Now, if you, if you take the cross-sectional area of that tree, that's the basal area of that tree. And what's kind of neat is that the biomass or volume of a tree within most of the diameters we work with 
increases approximately linearly with basal area. So when we measure basal area, we get a, a rough estimate of what's the biomass of that forest out there. The other thing to, to think about, because of just plain simple geometry, it takes 16 one-inch trees to have the same basal area as one four-inch diameter tree. So the biomass of a four-inch tree is the same roughly as 16 one-inch trees. Just a, a couple other technical terms. I'll talk about Uggs versus uh, Ags. Uggs are unacceptable growing stock. And the definition is going to depend upon your situation and what you're using. But generally speaking, as trees with poor, poor form, they've got, you know, some pretty bad uh, crook in them, you know, excessive sweep. They have a low fork, so you, you can't, you know, use them for timber products. Obviously, if you're doing managing for wildlife, you might have a different perspective on this. Uh, trees which are in poor health, they're either dead or dying. Uh, if they have a high percentage of call, they have a lot of uh, decay in them. Uh, either internal or exter externally visible decay, or if they're an undesirable species, and that's really going to depend on your local markets. Uh, for when purposes of this talk and what I talk about uh, for the rest, uh, calls are mixed in with unacceptable growing stock. An eggs or acceptable growing stock is a tree that's not an UG. So again, just uh, re. Uh, Revisit what we talked about earlier. What's a poorly stocked stand? It's uh, either, if you want to, it could be below 60 or 40% uh, stocking. Or I just like to use that rule of thumb. It's a tree which is less than 50 uh, square feet basal area per acre of acceptable growing stock. And I think this is uh, the last definition I just want to get for those who might be new to forestry. In, in forestry, we talk about stands, and those are trees which have an area which has trees and a structure of, of a similar composition and structure. So if we look at this area, area surrounded by blue where I'm moving the cursor around, you can see that's got a fine texture to it. That's actually a, a slightly younger stand uh, than the stand immediately below it, the white one I'm circling now, where that's a, a larger stand of uh, oak and sugar maple which really doesn't have any canopy openings to it. And those stands actually, just from your earlier shot, don't look too bad. The ones circled in green are the conifer stands. And granted, these are a little bit smaller than foresters would usually use. But if we look at this sort of orange triangle that I'm circling right now, you can see there's great big holes in the canopy. This is where they came in, had a harvest, and that sort of darker brown you can see in there, that really fine texture, that's all Japanese barbarium, all four rows mixed in together. So that's a stand where they have poor stocking. It's a degraded stand. Um, they're just not getting any regeneration back. Well, if you use the whole stand approach, you're going to treat, let me go backwards. If you use a whole stand approach, you're going to treat this entire stand the same. This stand over here, the white stand, which got the mature oak and sugar maple, that you probably would want to give the same prescription or the same management to the entire unit. But imagine if your stand was like this, if you do the same prescription, the same management, you have very different starting conditions. Well, if you have a large stand which has been, uh, been degraded because someone's came in and high graded it or you had a fire or an insect outbreak, sort of like here in Connecticut, uh, one of the state forest lands, uh, has a couple hundred acres where 90% of the trees have been killed by gypsy moth. They're just going to use a stand level approach for that entire stand. And if you're looking at stand level approach, there's a, a great booklet put out by Wayne Clatterbuck. I'll leave this up in a minute so you can write this down at University of Tennessee. And he actually worked with uh, Jeff Stringer over at the University of Kentucky. And they have some, some guidelines on when you look at a whole stand and how you would treat that entire stand to come up with a prescription for it. So I'll give folks just a minute to write that down if they want. Those professional hardwood notes are actually some great, oh, Pete just put down the, the label to it if you look over in the uh, comments section. Thank you, sir. <laughs> 
Here's the problem though, as I've showed before in that orange stand, high graded poorly stocked stands often have very patchy structure. They'll have some areas where you've got no large trees, you have some regeneration, some areas where they just left behind junky poles, and some areas where you might have some larger trees or you could have some of the larger trees are, are hit with uh, things like uh, beech bark disease. So you have very different stand structures and you really want to consider possibly having a different prescription for each one. The thing is that pre-prescription inventories, if you're doing the whole stand, inventories cost money. To write a prescription plan or management plan, that costs money. And poorly stocked stands often have little value. So it's pretty tough to go out there and economically justify going out there and doing an inventory, coming up with a prescription before you even start the management because you've got to pay for those out of, out of hand. To give an example of this, I look at it, some of the stands where we're doing our research on. The top two stands were both stands that were high graded and then donated to a uh, land trust. The, the bottom stand was, was a stand that was high graded in part before it was given to land trust. And the bottom right was a stand where uh, a new logger came on this site, started high grading before the owner found it and was able to stop it and try to recover it. So let me explain a little bit about what you're seeing on all these stands. Every one of the columns you see represents a 10th acre plot. That's how we went out there and measured it. The pink squares above each one are unacceptable growing stock. What you really want to focus on for each one of these 10th acre stands that each column represents are the, the blue parts of the stand. That represents acceptable growing stock. And if we go with Wayne Clatterbuck's definition of you want at least 50, where's there? If you want at least 50 square feet of acceptable growing stock, this first stand had 0% of, of the stands, uh, of the micro 10th acre stands had acceptable growing stock. This other one at Bass Road Preserve, only about 6% of the area had acceptable growing stock on it. East River Preserve wasn't too bad, about half of it, but that still means half of the area when measured in 10th acre stands did not have acceptable growing stock. And the last one, Rebecca's Hill, I mean, you know, the basal area is through the roof on here. I mean, close to a quarter of the area had over 150 square feet of basal area. But a lot of that was in low quality beech, in low quality hemlock, in red maple, which uh, had some significant uh, decay in it. So that's the thing we're often faced with is these stands have very regular stand structure, which when you write a prescription, are you going to write a prescription? Well, we'll ignore these guys. We'll look at East River Preserve where I'm circling the arrow. Are you going to write the prescription for here? Are you going to write the prescription for these conditions? Are you going to do it for a stand average? So what do you do? Well, again, if we just look at stands, and let's, I'm going to zoom in on this sort of triangle surrounded by orange down here. You could consider doing a micro stand approach. And that's thinking about the area which more and more typically we're seeing mechanized harvesting out there with a harvesting unit. And what's interesting is that harvesting unit harvests an area of about one-tenth of an acre in size. So if we go out there and think about it, if we were to have the money, we could never do this, but to map in uh, each one of the 10 acres that could be covered by this harvester, we could see there could be some areas where you actually have uh, some decent timber and you could do traditional forest thinning. Some areas where the invasives were just out of controls, and some areas that are a mixture of each, where you've got some pole trees that are halfway decent, but you don't have any regeneration. So on, on this you know, theoretical example, hypothetical example here, you really want to come up with three different stand prescriptions. So there's some great work, and I want to write, let you write this down while I'm taking a quick sip of water. By Luce, I hope I'm pronouncing that right and Meek out of Quebec, where they came up with this idea of harvesting micro stands, of going back and looking at the area that could be harvested by a harvester and coming up with prescriptions where they would train, where they did train, in fact, they're using this in Quebec now, where they could train uh, the equipment operator to recognize the conditions every time he moved his equipment forward 
and then implement the prescription. So for example, in this one, if they had a multi-storied maple stand, they would do a partial regeneration cut to get it back. If they didn't have a lot of maples out there, but there are a lot of saplings, do a clear cut, release all those saplings, allow a brand new stand to grow in that 10th acre. They looked at a closed canopy. If it was a closed canopy and it wasn't what they wanted, maybe do a shelter wood cut and try to get that regeneration started. And sometimes one of the things they have too is they'll have the, uh, the cutter on the uh, harvester actually do a little bit of scarification or have them drop the blade when they're moving out of the site and do some scarification. And if they didn't have that, just get out there and, and have the cutter just cut everything they could to cut the brush out of the way. So what they did is they trained, they trust, but verify. So they went out and what they reported is that 90% of the time, the equipment operator would do the same treatment on the plot as the forester would do out there. And for anyone who's gone out there and started squirting paint on trees, you know that if, if two foresters agree 90% of the time what's going to be done in a patch, you're doing pretty good. So what they do, like I said, is they went out there, they trained them. They would go out there uh, when they were first doing it, give them positive feedback on the training, and they'd go out there and check up on them. And I think you'll find that, especially nowadays, most loggers really want to do a good job. And I think, I would imagine, because we've actually never done this with them, but they would like to, res if you gave them the responsibility, you still write the prescription, but you're trusting them to do it. And I think most people respond very positively to it. So I'll talk a little bit about what our work is on forest rehabilitation. We used a micro stand approach and we had some great, great collaborators. Uh, the Winchester Land Trust, the Wiananog Heritage Land Trust, Rebecca's Hill Flora and Fauna Preservation Society, Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, the Guilford Land Trust and the White Memorial Foundation. Great collaborators. And our study sites were scattered all over the state. This is just an example of one of our experimental layouts so you get a feel for what we did out there. And if you look out there, every one of these plots, we went out there, you know, being researched, we actually just pre-assigned what we were gonna do on every one after we looked at the conditions and saw if it hit the qualifications. Now, how did we come up with the prescription for each one of these micro stands? Whoops, I meant to point this out first. Every one of our stands was 20 by 20 meters for those of you, especially in Canada, who like metric. It was about a tenth of an acre for those of us in the States. And that's a roughly a 30 foot uh, radius. And that's about how big, uh, you know, a harvester will be operating, how big of a circle. So we came up with a couple of different uh, prescription criteria. And this is something you could certainly develop locally uh, for your own self. And that's, if you had, if we had on these at least five well-spaced quality pole timber stands, we would just cut the larger competitions of those poles. And this is our low intensity. If uh, we had 10 well-spaced, if we didn't have that, but we had 10 well-spaced saplings, well, we cut all the poles and calls and we would let that sapling stand develop into the next stand. If we had two to four uh, well-spaced poles, we would cut all the poles and call trees except for those target poles. The idea we get regeneration coming in underneath, and then we would end up having um, a uh, two-age stand. If we didn't have any of that, uh, but we had some advanced regeneration, we would cut all the poles and calls and hope that that advanced generation would be able to continue growing. And if we had none of that, which we had on some of the sites, uh, we would cut them all, and uh, we did broadcast control, herbicide control of all interfering vegetation. We also had a high intensity uh, one, which I'm not gonna go into. If you want, you can write to me, I'll give you that. We just did it a, a little more intensely for the uh, pole trees. We did crop tree release. The same with the saplings. We uh, cut all the poles and then we did a crop tree release. So we actually had a, another higher one. So it's just what some of them look like. This is a high intensity uh, two age plot. And it's actually an area with a lot of deer. Where we are fortunate there, we actually had some uh, large oak poles. Uh, so we left those out there, roughly five per acre. 
And because we had no regeneration out there except for beech, which we actually uh, did apply herbicide to kill, uh, we did an underplanting. I wanted to point out, there's a picture of J.P. Barsky, who's my right hand, and uh, right hand and does a lot of the technical work on the field. On another area, uh, we had, you know, some great looking uh, poles. This happens to be a stand with a lot of yellow birch in it, uh, you know, about six inches in diameter. And so we released those, but we only cut away the largest competition. We didn't give them complete four-sided release. Here's that stand from hell I showed you that was a uh, completely crappy red maple with some ash and was completely covered with invasives. There was no acceptable growing stock tree in this area, so we cut everything down. Uh, because this is research, we didn't haul the stuff out. I would normally, or I would think if it was a small landowner, this is something you could do and you could take the firewood out. If it was a place where you had a, uh, a chip market, uh, you know, you go through the harvester and cut out all the poles and put them in the chipper and haul them out. And here again, uh, afterwards we went through, or actually before we did the harvest, we went through and uh, treated all the invasives, which is something else I would suggest. Do it before the harvest. It's a lot easier walking through a stand when you're not walking over slash. And then we plant it afterwards. So what can you do? We talked a little bit about the micro stand approach with the residual stems. So one of the things when we went through and we, we did this uh, cutting, we found out we were able to remove most of the acceptable growing stock. So we converted these stands to stands that were dominated by unacceptable growing stock or UGS and the stands that were dominated by acceptable growing stock. So no longer, not only did acceptable growing stock now dominate uh, the residual stand, we also increased the composition of the stand. Uh, we increased the proportion of oak and hickory, uh, increased uh, the proportion of birch. You notice that there was some unacceptable growing stock we left on these stands. And that was because of the landowner's objectives on these stands in part was wildlife. And we did have some unacceptable growing stock, uh, black cherry and white pine, and some of the larger cavity trees that we left on site for those other landowner objectives. But we definitely improved uh, the stand composition. One of the things when you do uh, the release on these, and it's like most of the other crop tree or thinning studies, when you give trees full release, you dramatically increase their diameter growth. That clear cut is not from central New York, that's from central Connecticut. <laughs> Same thing with ferns as with barberry. But to get back to the slide here, the more you release a tree, the more it's gonna grow. So if you're able to cut off uh, some uh, low quality red maple from on top of some oak poles, they can respond. Same with hickory. Here's where I think is one of the neatest slides at all. Let me explain it. If we look on the right, we circle here, we see acceptable growing stock in control or uncut areas and unacceptable growing stock in the control or uncut areas. If we look at these control areas, the uncut areas, except most of the basal area growth that we had on these was in the unacceptable growing stock. Close to seven square feet per acre over four years is in unacceptable growing stock. But if we look at acceptable growing stock, it was only three and a half square feet. So most of the growth on, on those areas are unacceptable growing stock. If we look in the areas that we treated, where we came in and tried these treatments, we see a flip. Now acceptable growing stock, a great proportion of what's growing is acceptable growing stock and is not unacceptable growing stock. We've started the road to recovery of these stands just by going out there and cutting down uh, you know, the unacceptable growing stock. What about the, uh, the sapling size class? Well, if you look at the saplings, and I think a lot of us have seen this, if you go through a stand and you've got a lot of residual red maples or crappy birch or crappy uh, beech, you're gonna find pockets where you actually have some oak saplings out there. And the thing is, if you do nothing, they averaged one inch in diameter when we went out there. It's about 10, 15 years after the harvest. So they're about one inch in diameter. Over the next four years, that tree grew about a third of an inch. It grew almost nothing. Just by going out there and cutting off that 
crappy red maple, the, mostly it's red maple that we were cutting off, it was over top. We could dramatically increase the growth rate of, of those oaks just by doing that one step. Here's a, the problem though, is that, well, if you're growing white pine, that's not bad, but white pine and black birch were growing much faster, even in the areas where we left the red maple on. So you're gonna be losing that oak if maintaining oak on the site is one of the things you wanted to do. If you want to get back oak, you're really going to have to give it a, a, a second release because one of the things we found is that oak that's not in, at the same height, it's not either dominant or co-dominant with the other saplings when that stand canopy closes, they just are not going to remain in the upper canopy over the next 25 years. If you do go out there, and that's one of the things I think we'll be doing here in the next year or two, and releasing those oak, we find we could dramatically increase proportion of those oaks that are gonna be in that stand, or gonna be in the upper canopy 25 years later. Just one quick thing on pole and stall timber to show you another study where we looked at 18 years. If you look at the pole timber trees, those are less than 10 and a half inches in diameter, roughly 25 centimeters. Are those that are 10 and a half to 12 inches in diameter, roughly uh, 25 to 30 centimeters in diameter. If you do crop tree release around those trees, similar to what we're doing in the rehabilitation, you can dramatically increase the amount of growth that you're going to have in those trees, just with a single crop tree release. So let's look at regeneration and try to keep this on schedule. Uh, I really want to give a lot of credit to Ralph Nyland. I took a screenshot of his slide because I wanted to use his words, and I like the way he puts it. What do you need to do to get regeneration? You got to shoot the deer, poison the beach, manage the light, and keep trees a high vigor. And I think I agree with that 100%. So you can go out there and do hunting, and, and hunting helps. The trouble is with recreational hunting in areas that can maintain high deer herds is you can't really get deer densities below 16 deer per square mile. And you commonly need to get deer densities below 12 deer per square mile. Skip over that because I'm running a little bit long. Here's one of the problems uh, with deer. This is one of, uh, this is Lake Gillard that's near here that at the time had 60 to 80 deer per square mile. All those little seedlings you see in the ground were 17 year old sugar maples. This is a stand where you could shoot 200 yards through the woods because of deer. Until they had deer control and they actually have a hunt out there now, uh, you're never gonna get back regeneration. And it's not just deer can cause problems. You can have moose are causing problems in some areas. Uh, luckily, most of the Northeast, we don't have to deal with hogs. And we've actually seen some areas where uh, voles uh, can cause some pretty significant uh, damage uh, to small seedlings. So we looked at, we wanted to look at the influence of deer too, but at the stand level, which is kind of tough. So this is, uh, we're about halfway done, actually about two thirds of the way done with a study well, we're going out to areas that have shelter woods or clear cuts, final overstory removal. And this is a summary of, uh, all together we're hoping to get 80 stands. So this is a summary of 44 stands uh, covering about 1,600 acres. And what we did in each one of these stands is we put in a, a circular six foot radius plot to make it simple. We saw how many oaks there were out there and whether or not those oaks were free to grow. So this oak right here, you can see in the picture to the right, the red hat, that's on top of an oak, which actually at this point is still free to grow, still has the sunlight. If you look in the picture of the left, you can see the orange hat. Well, that's the top of, of an oak right there, but you can see it's completely surrounded by taller black birch and red maple. So what we found out there is, I'll explain this graph a little bit. So let's look at areas that were five to, actually three to 10 years after we did a clear cut, final overstory removal. If we looked at areas that weren't hunted, we see that this black area means we estimated, not to go into details on that, that this stand in the future is gonna have roughly no oaks. Per, the entire stand is gonna have no oaks that are gonna be free to grow when the stand is about 30 years old. It's gonna have maybe 20% of it's gonna have 10 oaks per acre. Just by looking at other areas where there was hunting on it, we can see that we're gonna have 
almost 40% of the area is going to have 160 oaks per acre, which you could argue is too many. If you add in, where's the arrow? There we go. If you add in the areas that are going to have either 60 or 80 oaks per acre, with those that are 160, you're going to see over half the stands. And 90% of the stands are going to have at least 20 oaks per acre. Compare that with up here, where you've got two thirds of the stands, roughly, are going to have very few oaks per acre. We found basically the same results in shelter woods, areas that weren't hunted. Um, close to 60% of the stands had fewer than 10 oaks per acre that were gonna be free to grow. Why areas that were hunted, we see if we look at orange, which is 40 oaks per acre, we've got three quarters of the stands are gonna have at least 40 oaks per acre. You're gonna to wanna to increase your trees from browse damage. If you plant a tree and don't protect it from browse damage, you're just wasting your time in areas with large deer herds. You can't put up fencing, but fencing's gotta be at least eight feet high in most areas, and it can be very expensive. From a talk 10 years ago in Pennsylvania, they say it cost them approximately $8,000 an acre to fence 25 acres. And for that same amount of money, a sharpshooter could control deer in about a square mile. So that's just, most of us don't have the financial uh, resources the state of Pennsylvania does to keep deer out. The other thing that Ralph Diamond said is poison the beach. Couldn't agree more. Beach can be, we don't want to get rid of all beach, but beach can be a real problem. But it's not just beach as competitive interference. We've got a lot of others. Uh, Japanese stiltgrass is becoming a huge problem in Southern New England. Mile a minute it is in some places. Somebody asked a quick question, why are beach a problem? Beach are a problem because they form such dense shade that they preclude or exclude any other regeneration coming in. And in most of the country we have beach bark disease, which beach really cannot get much bigger than six to 10 inches in diameter before it's killed by beach bark disease they break off and you just have beach suckers coming up. Those beach suckers never really get big enough to even form a good beach nut crop, which if beach is not bad for wildlife, if you have a beach nut crop, it's not bad. Well, I don't think it's a bad wood, although it's, it's tough to uh, dry and machine for building for blocks. But there's other invasives too, that are increasing problems. We have bittersweet further uh, into Northern New England and uh, into uh, New York and parts of Pennsylvania. We have buckthorn and what we've made our bread and butter on, which is barberry. Occasionally, huckleberry, some of the ericaceous shrubs can be a problem. Certainly in, in parts of New York, large parts of Pennsylvania, parts of New England, hay-centered ferns are a real problem. Um, I said beach is a problem, so it's not just natives. Mountain laurel can be a real problem when you get dense mountain laurel sands. And there's certainly other species. I mean, honeysuckle is the one that comes to mind. So you have some options for controlling this competitive interference. If you've got a big area, uh, there's nothing like a, a backpack mist blower, but realize if you do that, if you have any regeneration coming out there, um, unless you can do some great timing, you're gonna kill your native regeneration. You can spot treat, which is much more expensive, or even more expensive, but much more fun is go out there with a backpack propane torch. So just to show you, uh, sort of getting towards the tail end here, this is a study we did. If you look in the bottom of each of these two graphs, it shows how many years since we treated the invasive species. Uh, the graph on the right is inside the exclosure where there's no deer. The graph to the left is outside the exclosure where there was deer. And these are seedlings that are greater than three feet tall. So outside the exclosure, the graph to the left, in areas where we mowed down the barberry and then heated it twice with propane to try to kill it, and we pretty much did kill it, you see that we're starting to finally, after nine years, get uh, sufficient saplings that are at least three feet high, but those are still being hammered by the deer. Why inside the exclosure, we hit that 500 mark four seasons after we did the initial treatment. And we actually got up to 1,500 per acre three feet in high, you go, well, you know what? It looks like it's starting to fall. Well, it's starting to fall because a lot of those three footers are now six, nine, 10 feet hey, high. Jeff. Yeah. You're, you, something happened with your microphone. Can you still hear me? Barely. Just a second. Oh, thanks for cutting in, Pete. 
Can you hear me now? Uh, all right, maybe it's mine. <laughs> Never mind. Everybody else can hear you fine. Oh, Never okay. mind. Keep going. No, no problem. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm trying to get this wrapped in. So lastly, manage the light. If you're trying to get regeneration, it's sort of the Goldilocks solution. You want roughly 30% if you want oak. If you let in more light than that, you're going to get in Tula poplar. Uh, black birch is going to tend to come in more. You get less than that, you're going to tend to get beech or sugar maple. And maybe that's a good thing, depending upon what your management goal is. I'm um, running out of time here, so I'll tell you what, to leave time for questions, I'm going to do this really quick. We just looked at oak sprouts. Here's the bottom line if you look over to the left. Uh, there's a oak sprout that was in a cage uh, protected from deer browse uh, in two years. It was already six foot high. If you look at the oak that JP is pointing to, that's two years and it's barely doing any growing. We did find as birch comes in, the other oak, the oak that's not caged will grow, but we've lost one year's growth. And that's enough to prevent most of the oak from becoming free to grow. So free to grow are oaks that are getting full sunlight. So if you looked at this one on the left that says caged, close to 90% of the stumps that had a sprout had a free to grow sprout. Well, if you looked at those that didn't have any protection, even though the deer browse only reduced growth by one year, not even 50% of those stumps produce a sprout, which had a free to grow sprout. So what we've covered here today are we talked about uh, what is a degraded stand, the fact that it's an incredible problem across the landscape and some of the causes, primarily high grading. Uh, like I said, I promote the uh, micro stand approach uh, for a, maybe for more private lands where we've got large scale insect outbreaks, you probably wanna use a whole stand approach. And you want to consider what you're treating. If you're looking for treating residual stems that you have there, try to get them to grow or uh, regenerate the stand. So with that, hopefully I left a few minutes for questions. Yes, you did. Thank you, Jeff. Great job. Um, so uh, there's a question from Kathy about the presentation on YouTube. So this is being recorded and it will be posted on the Forest Connect YouTube channel. So all of the Forest Connect webinars over the last 10 years have been archived onto YouTube. So just go to youtube.com slash Forest Connect. Um, so Jeff, I'll take uh, the host's prerogative. I get the first question and this sure. is, you've got like, uh, there have been more comments and questions for this than I think we've seen in a very long time. So this is really good. Um, so my question, and, and it's, it, it came up about halfway through and then you were focusing in on it towards the end. What, what happens with these oak and what I see in a lot of New York is that we'll get oak seedlings or oak stump sprouts and eventually they'll get, you know, they'll gain in, gain in height, you know, if there's not too much deer pressure but they're, they look, they're multi-stem. You know, you look at how many terminals they have and you have three or five or 15 terminals. Do those, do you think those will ever develop into quality saw logs or are they always going to be multi-stemmed, poor quality trees? It's really good. That's a great question, Pete. And it's really going to depend upon where the, the stems originate. If they originate at the base and they're growing up, like you'll see in an area without a lot of deer browse, um, you know, we've all seen forests where you've, you'll see uh, saw timber stump sprouts where you'll have two, three, occasionally four out of, you know, where there used to be a stump 100 years ago. I think the problem we're going to see with some of these stems that are repeatedly deer browsed, even if they eventually get up, you're going to start having some larger branches form pretty close to the ground. From a wildlife standpoint, that's probably not an issue. If you're trying to grow timber, I think it's going to be a real issue. Because you're going to have branches get up to two, three inches in diameter before they're shaded off and die. And you're going to have some permanent defect into that log. Okay. That's been my observation. I was just, and I haven't found any research on that, but it just, it seems like deer are going to have a, um, a long duration impact on the quality of trees. Even if you maintain the diversity in the stand, mm -hmm. the quality of the stems is going to be uh, depressed. Right. So can you see the chat window or do you want me to? Oh, I can see the chat okay, window. Okay, so if you want to scroll back to the uh, back to the top and I'll let you, or do you want me to read the questions? How do you want to handle those? Well, I'll just start going down and. All right. So I'll if you want to so scroll. You have yeah, to scroll. I'll put it over here so everybody can, I'll cover up the bear. Can you see that? 
Uh, you don't see the Zoom chat? I can, oh. No. Oh, okay. Well, I guess I just something happened on your screen, but. Okay. Do, do, do. Let's see. Going down, 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 down. I was trying to take a quick. For those the, of you who aren't out there, it's a little bit tougher when you can't maintain eye contact and see what someone wanted. Climate change could be in the future. I don't think it is yet. The only species I think which is really being affected potentially now is paper birch. Because as things get warmer, paper birch becomes more susceptible to bronze birch borer. I would agree with John that 80% is in 20. How would it be possible? Could it be? I would say most of this is, is not, you say improper forest management. I wouldn't even call it forest management. I would call it timber mining. I mean, in my mind, a forester is thinking about the future of the stand and trying to promote it. So we're always thinking decades out in advance. If you're just coming out there and cutting down trees of value, you're not doing forestry. And that's just one man's opinion. Is it better defined as a diameter limit cutting with species selection? Do, do, do. I'm not sure I can answer that really quick because I'm not sure exactly what the question was. Trachy. Well, there, there is a difference between high grading and diameter limit cut. And actually I was trying to find Bill Leake's paper where he's done up in New Hampshire where you cut, if you do a diameter limit cut and you cut the calls out at the same time, they've actually found that they were able to uh, maintain uh, decent stand stocking and basal area growth over time. But that's one of the critical things. I mean, I'm not promoting basal, I mean, diameter limit cutting. But if you're doing it, if at least you could cut the call trees out of there, the trees which are going to have no value going in the future. That costs money, which sort of goes against the grain of a diameter limit cut. Let's see. I can't agree more with Carl. We need to manage our force with a goal of future sustainability. But that's, like I said, for me, that's what forestry is. Doing the inventory can be a first look by the forester as well as base. Yeah, I was just thinking that 200 acre uh, stand that uh, Connecticut is going to be managing because 90% or more of the oaks have been killed by a gypsy moth. They did a walkthrough out there and said that uh, going out there and trying to, you know, mark every individual tree is just going to be a waste of time. Should you do a walkthrough? Yeah, but there's a difference between if, if it's a badly, de you know, if it's a bad stand, you're going to be spending a lot of money walking through there. Um, and actually taking a lot of plot data. I think most of us, once you've been out in the field a little bit, you should be able to, if you walk through the entire stand and not just do a roadside survey, you should get a pretty good feel for the stand. And, you know, so you spend 20 minutes, half an hour walking through a stand. You get a good feel for it, and then you can decide, okay, this is worth going out there and actually, uh, you know, doing a quick inventory to, prior to doing a, uh, a management prescription or this is a stand where it's really not, you know, it's not worth investing the, the client's time to, uh, to do an inventory and writing up a detailed prescription plan. Also degradation is happening in Toronto, even without much target of walking. See, there's a real problem that Galvin's talking about up there in Toronto. It's not just in Toronto. There's large parts of the Northeast, unfortunately, with all these non-native uh, problems with emerald ash borer and beech bark disease. God forbid we ever have Asian longhorn beetle ever gets out into the landscape. Um, Pete, that might be something to try to f have somebody come together and figure out how are we gonna manage forests with invasive species in the understory? That's a whole nother thing. 10 acres, not clear cut. Yeah, I know a clear cut has to be at least one tree height and I think at least two tree heights. I'm just talking a total overstir removal in that area. Micro stand approach. Okay, Pete, I didn't know about that one. About vine growth, the expense of canopy trees. Yeah, vines, uh, 
apparently poison ivy actually is one of the species that does be better and better and increase CO2, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but the problem with some species like uh, oriental bittersweet and myelominate is there's no established uh, insect or pathogen which is going to keep it in check. And so they're going to continue to grow because it, they just had the competitive advantage. That's why a lot of invasive species do so well, is native species have insects that are always eating on them. And native species don't. And, um, oh, shoot, I'm blanking on the guy from Delaware who wrote the book about how many insects, Doug Talame uh, has written a great book about the, uh, the benefits of native species for maintaining Lepidoptera. Uh, you know, butterflies and moss because of all the uh, caterpillars that feed on them. Yeah, European beech, I think, is a very different beast. I've never seen, or I don't think I've ever seen European beech root sucker. So it's a very different thing. Susan has a great comment, but I'm not going to get into policy because I'm just uh, an ivory tower guy. D debris sometimes can minimize deer impact. Um, it's going to depend upon how high your deer herd is. I know Pete's trying uh, to put up his uh, brush fences. We'll see how those work this winter. Stand from hell. Weed whack the ferns. The trouble what I've seen from weed whacking uh, hay centered fern is it seems to come back just stronger unless you're willing to go out there and whack it down once a month. That's something you can do in a garden, but I think it's pretty impractical to do out in the forest. They have had some luck in Pennsylvania from what I've seen um, going out there. And once they put a fence in to keep the deer away, they have trees gradually pushed through the hay-centered fern. And a lot of times these invasives in the ferns actually go hand in hand with too high of deer populations. Let's see, atmospheric. That's actually another interesting thing. Tom Schuler actually, I got to get this graph from him, talked about how they put in air pollution control, how there's tremendous nitrogen deposition across the landscape. And that might have shifted, been some of the reasons we've seen some of these mesophysic species uh, like red maple and birch doing much better. Following up on Ben Roach's research, if you tried cutting the oak saplings, um, that can work in areas where there aren't any deer. And it's not only Ben Roach, but there's been some other people. If you cut an oak sapling, especially if it's got a stagnant top, it's going to grow fast. The problem we have in a lot of Connecticut is we have so many deer. If you cut them down, the deer preferentially feed on the, uh, the buds of those oak saplings. So if you have anything above deer browse height, I would just leave it because chances are you're going to be a real problem. I think I already answered why beach are a problem. What is mile a minute? It's a scary one. You're not from uh, region, you're not from Pennsylvania, New York, or Southern New England, or else you've seen mile a minute. Hopefully, you'll never get it. Peach says there's some good beach webinars on there. Leaving high stumps. That's actually another strategy that you can do. I didn't know anyone was leaving them two to three feet high. Hmm. I'd break off, and I think. Let's see, poor forest management, like again, I would say that those really, unless it's from an insect outbreak, a disease outbreak, storm damage, I mean, a tornado can cause degraded stands, uh, fire, it's really not management if you go out there and high grade it. That can actually be a problem, high equipment costs, actually, in another study we had, uh, somebody had bought some uh, new iron. And we found out afterwards that he was supposed to cut it to 60%. We had marked the trees, and we found out he cut a bunch of trees he wasn't supposed to. He ended up being kicked off state land for years. Okay, so stand development slide comparing oak, red maple, and oak. Certain percentage need to be dominant. Could I cover that briefly again? Uh, Dave, if you're still there or anybody else, if you want to send me an email, I can send you the paper because that would be kind of tough to cover without going back over the slides. I'm more than happy to send you the paper.
Okay, most private forestry's not owned. That's another real problem, but that would be a policy thing. I mean, most states have a tax uh, reduction if you keep land in forest land. I personally think that should be tied to having a management plan on the site, which is followed through, which doesn't happen everywhere. Uh, to do forest management versus forest mining. <laughs> forest slogging is a great tool to keep costs lower. I think there's only one horse logger in all of Connecticut. I don't know how many are out there. If you have some uh, the Amish around or Mennonites, they, you might have a better stand for micro stand approach. Can talk more about how the contract with the operator was structured. We actually uh, did all the cutting ourselves because these were non-commercial sales. These are just research where we did it. Uh, if you contacted the folks up in Ontario, in the earlier slide, you might have to go through the presentation again to find it. Uh, let me see if I can find that really quick. Let's see. I hit escape. Whoops, wrong one. So if you're still there, if you contact uh, Luce, I think so I pronounce it, and Meek, they're out of uh, the Canadian Forest Service. You might be able to ask them. I haven't heard how they did the contract with them. That would actually, that's a great question. I don't know. Change in pH over, so question about change in pH of soils over time and investive. Uh, you can either, uh, yeah, paper and pencil, it's paper and pencil, it's K-O-U-R, TEV and Barberry, or just put in, bar, or just Google Barberry and soils. Uh, it does change pH in soil. You also have a problem with, uh, at least with Barberry, that increases uh, nitrification of the soil. So nitrogen becomes available very quickly, but then is lost out of the system. They've done a whole series of papers. Uh, shoot, he did that with, was that done down in Maryland? I can't remember where that was done with. Many land trusts in Maine are exploring active harvesting, help cover costs, but they don't often have. How do we do a land trust a better job? Boy, I wish I knew. Thought about using forest drones. I would love to have one. They're not markets for craft wood in some calls. There are markets for craft wood, but there's not, I don't think there's a big enough market. Different approach. If you want to know about tick populations, <laughs> uh, if uh, Joe Ellen is still there, uh, we actually have a number of papers on controlling invasives and the impact on tick populations. Bottom line, if you control invasives, at least barberry, and I suspect rose, you can cut tick populations by about two thirds. Success with deer repellents, no real success with deer repellents. You have to apply them, uh, even the ones that are labeled you don't have to, you've got to apply them a couple of times a year so you can use them in a garden situation. Again, we actually have some papers where we've looked at that, that Scott Williams and my group has worked on. Think about the, the ticks, and this is for anybody who's still on, it looks like there's still some people listening. There are some stuff, you can either get treated pants or you can spray your clothes. I recently found out that Connecticut uh, DEEP, that's the state foresters, and one of the uh, water companies here is buying treated clothes. We've been using treated clothes. Uh, it's, we haven't had any uh, tick bites where somebody's got infected in the last two years. The people using the clothes have reported it cuts tick bites by about 90%. You just spray the stuff on your clothes, you wait a couple hours, you put it on, and it'll last a month or more, depends upon how much uh, you're washing your clothes. For my crew now and for the state crews, you are not allowed to go out in the field without treated clothes. It's just like wearing, it'd be just like uh, using a chainsaw without wearing chaps in an integrated helmet. It's just damn silly and you're asking to get sick. Bittersweet, got to hit before it fruits. I think a, a good thing is, is to, uh, Cut the, it'll, if nothing else, cut off the ones that are growing up the trees. Believe it or not, deer will browse on um, bittersweet. And one of the ironic things, uh, I can't soil con I think it was the Soil Conservation Service back in the 60s was actually uh, promoting uh, oriental bittersweet, Asiatic bittersweet, 
uh, to be grown uh, for birds and for deer browse down south. Recommended change if there's no beach bark disease. If you can grow quality beach, I would, personally, I would say if that's what you can grow on your site and you can grow quality beach, nothing wrong with growing beach. Would deeper scarification of the soil help? I think the big thing with ferns, again, is if you can keep the deer off of them, trees can eventually push through. I've seen in Northern Connecticut, uh, one of the foresters up there, Curtis Ram, put in Shoot, I can't remember it's a 20 or 40 acre cut. And it took, I think it took him about 15 years, but the tree, actually he's got a fair amount of oak pushing up through there too. The trees will push through the ferns, but they also at the same time implemented a, uh, a deer reduction program. Provided reference for the high nitrogen, nitrate dip. That was from Tom Schuler, who's probably not gonna be answering emails now because he's uh, he's acting head of uh, the research program for the Forest Service now, supervisor. Uh, you'd have to look it up. I'm, I'm going to try to find it myself. Bob and the Trees, that was actually pretty good. We had that at New England SAF. Let's see. J.D. Irvin is using drones. Actually, a lot of people now are using uh, – there's a great article in the re most recent Northern Logger about using uh, LIDAR for laying out skid roads and everything else. Reference for removing ticks. Uh, again, write to me. Or Pete, are you making notes on any of this? I can give you some of the references that you can put on later. Um, I'm taking some notes, yes. So I can actually put links to some of those papers for the ticks and for the crop tree management and for deer repellents. Other in fencing and metal cages, plastic tubing. <sighs> We've had real mixed results with using solid tubes. And I think most people now are going more towards open mesh tubes. It depends on how dense uh, your deer is. Insect Shield's a brand name. Holy Moses, you guys are typing faster than I'm answering. Heavily browsed, and one year they grew six foot. Excellent. That's the big thing. If oaks have a decent root system, Curtis, Mark Curtis wrote that he had a small planting two-year-old red oak, heavily browsed. They cut them off and they grew six foot. Second year, they're above deer. It's going to depend upon how bad your deer density is. Everything about ticks, bug repellents, by pet collars around each ankle. I, I just spray my pants. Okay, information on ticks. Let's see. It looks like I'm pretty much, is there a supplier of open mesh tubes? Uh, yeah, forestry, your sort, forestry supplier, Ben Meadows sells them. If you just go on there and look. So I tell you, I want to thank everyone who's been uh, sitting in. I see there's still 111 people at least haven't signed out. So thank you all. And I wish one and all a joyous, happy, uh, joyous holiday season, Christmas in my house with my grandkids who now know who Santa Claus is. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Bye Jeff. Now. This was a great presentation. So Jeff will be back again at 7 o'clock. If you want uh, to see this for a second go around, you can. There's a ton of information, and, and I appreciate all the work that, that Jeff put into the presentation. So thank you all. Have a Merry Christmas, and we'll see you in January. Thank you, Jeff. Bye now.